Hi everyone, my name is Sophie Mathieu. I'm Head of Partnership for the Propelled by MEPM events. Happy to welcome you today for a new daily talk. Our discussion today will address data. Data is one of the five pillars of Propel events. Um, among others, which are sustainability, investment, talents, and user experience. And to talk about ethical challenges that property will face for, from data, I'm pleased to welcome today Dan Hughes, Director of Alpha Property Insight. Hi, Dan. How are you today? Oh, very good. Thanks very much. How are you? Good. Thank you. Um, thanks for being with us. Uh, just before you start, I uh, want to remind everyone that you can write uh, already your question in the Q&A uh, uh, section. And, uh, right after Dan's talk, we will, uh, we will under them. Okay, so you can start. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. Let me just share my screen. And with any luck, that means the presentation will come up. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for, for joining me. Um, Ethics is an enormous topic, uh, and it's something that's relatively new to the real estate sector, especially when it comes to the technology side of it. So what I want to do for about 15 minutes is just spend a few minutes exploring what do we mean by ethics? Why is it important to us? Why should uh, we care and why it matters? Work through a few examples of what it might look like to try and uh, be a catalyst for some thought, and then finally just look very quickly at some of the things that we could do to get started to address this. So I'm going to talk for 15, 20 minutes or so, run through some things, and then uh, very much look forward to your questions at the end. So I think with anything like this, a really good starting point is to start with a diction dictionary definition. So ethics are about the moral principles that govern a person's or a company's behavior or the conducting of an activity. So for me, it's the morals, it's the behaviors. Ultimately, this is all about trust. Trust in what we do, trust in the advice that we, um, that we give, and trust in the way that we do it. I think it's also worth saying that we, we talk a lot about technology, that's very much about what can be done, what is technologically possible to do. We talk about the legal aspects, which are incredibly important, GDPR in particular, but many others as well, and this is what we're allowed to do. And the ethics overlays all of that, and it, it, there's a, certainly a crossover, but I also think that it's a little bit different, and we shouldn't be completely confused. And ethics is really about what we should be doing or whether we should be doing it. So that's what we mean by ethics, but if we look at why it matters to us so much, um, on the left-hand side there, you can see uh, the results of the British Property Federation's survey into um, how the sector's perceived from last year. And generally speaking, it's fair to say that while certainly not terrible, it's also not that great. The perception of real estate in the property sector is not massively strong amongst the public and, uh, and stakeholders. And at the same time as that, the perception of organisation is very much driven by how trusted it is or how trusted the sector is. And we can look at an example here of Facebook and how people trust Facebook. And you'll see that large 66% decline in trust that came around the time of Cambridge Analytica scandals. And we can see that whilst trust can be very high and maintained, it takes one thing to, um, to dramatically drop the trust in the sector. And so the way that we use data and the way ethical um, use of it is going to become increasingly important to the sector's reputation and the trust in it. RICS and some other organisations that you can see at the bottom there, including GoReport, um, recently did a survey that they put out which looked at uh, the implications of prop tech and the perceptions. And one of the questions in there was about what are the biggest data challenges that we can face? And you can see that number one out of everything there that came out is about the ethics and the uh, privacy issues. And that's against the backdrop of things like access to data, data being in silos, the quality of data. And all of those are things that we've spoken about for many years. But actually, if data ethics is at the top, this is something that we really need to address as a sector very, very quickly. We can talk about many of these things in a very theoretical way, and for many years, these have been something that's going to happen in the future. But we have in the last year or so seen really quite a lot of examples where the ethical use or the implications of data use um, is starting to have a dramatic impact on the sector itself. So for example, the use of facial recognition um, in uh, public spaces or in buildings, the ethical use of that collection of data, um, Sidewalk Labs that recently pulled out of a project in Toronto in the last couple of weeks, uh, have faced a number of different challenges around how they're going to collect data and communicating that from an ethical point of view 
um, Amazon Alexa collecting all your, uh, listening to all your conversations allegedly. And then all the way at the bottom right hand side there, a company was recently prosecuted in Germany and fined 14 and a half million, euro dollar, uh, million euros uh, for collecting and keeping uh, unnecessary data. And so we can see that not only is this something that's going to be a problem in the future, we are just starting to see the tip of an iceberg of this problem coming through. And then the other thing that I would like to just mention is the role of the person in all this. Now, for the purpose of this, I've picked on the uh, RSCS Red Book that you can see there about valuations. But these principles apply to pretty much all professionals in what we do. And it talks here about bringing um, uh, required independence, objectivity, um, and scepticism to information and data. So the role of the human as it stands at the moment is going to increasingly be responsible for the data. Now that isn't a new thing in itself, but the data that we use, the volume of it is growing, the sources are growing, and we're going to have to continue taking responsibility for that. And so this is going to be a key challenge that as I go through a few examples, I'd like to just bear in mind how as a professional are you going to take responsibility for all these points. So what I'd like to do now is just work through some examples looking at what data we should collect or, or how we collect it, what data we use, how we use it, and then how we display it. And just pick on a couple of examples to really get um, the thought process going about the ethical implications. Ethics is obviously a very difficult thing to quantify. It's not a simple topic, but I hope this will at least put a starting point in place about uh, where we need to be exploring. And the first thing I'd like to talk about is what data we should be collecting. Now, Against the backdrop of coronavirus, there's a huge amount of talk at the moment about going back to the office, about how do we measure people's um, health, uh, when they're in, their temperatures. And that backdrop of, of the uh, conversation is going to accelerate this. But if we look at the example on here, the future of an office is all about well-being and productivity. And so we're going to have to measure those more and more. And eventually those statistics, numbers, and that data is going to feed into the valuation model. So the value of a building is going to be driven, an office is going to be driven much more by the productivity and well-being of the people. Now that's great, and we need data to inform that. So we can use, for example, facial recognition to understand who's in the building, where they're moving, we can detect whether they're happy or not and who they're talking to. We can use technology to increasingly track what people are doing on their computer, when they're typing, when they're logging in, um, and what sort of documents they're working on. We can use uh, biometric details to understand people's health and well-being within a building. And I think there's a very strong case for saying that the data taken out of all of those different types of measurements can feed into a much better valuation model. It will help us much better understand the, the value and the performance of a building. The question here is not technologically whether it can be done, which they can. Legally, this can be done. The question for me is whether this should be done. So personally, from an office point of view, I don't really want to be tracked that closely. Certainly, I want the building to, to work towards me and to help, but I also don't want to feel as I'm having my privacy invaded. So property managers and property owners are going to have to have a real um, think about what data not only can they collect, but what should they be collecting, how do they communicate it. The second thing is, is the data that we use to inform decisions and whether we can trust that data. So I want to look at this as a, um, an aerial uh, picture of a city or a town, the grey blocks being the buildings, green as a part there, and I want to pick on two very simple buildings, so number one, number two, and just look at some of the data inputs that we may use to try and inform the decision making if we were going to invest or to buy one of those buildings. And you can see there from all intents and purposes they look the same if we assume they're the same size and spec and so on. And one thing that we might look at is traffic data. So traffic data is good for two different things. Firstly, traffic is incredibly important. Access to buildings becomes important. If you can't get there for deliveries or for staff getting in, then that's obviously not a good uh, factor. But it's also a very good indicator of if you've got traffic, you're gonna have noise pollution and air pollution. So based entirely on this diagram, if we had to make a decision, we'd probably go for building number two in most circumstances because it's going to be a nicer environment and it's going to be easier to get to. And where would we get traffic information from? Well, I would argue one of the best live sources of traffic information you can get is Google Maps. So in Google Maps, pretty much any town or city in the world, you can get live traffic information about um, what's happening at that point in time. But the question here is, can we trust that? And you may have seen uh, a few weeks ago, a performance artist 
dragged around London a cart of 100 mobile devices which started influencing the data. And he was putting up photos of um, empty roads being shown as uh, traffic on uh, Google Maps. So as we start using that uh, data more and more for decision making, there's more and more incentive for people to start uh, influencing those data sets. Another example is about uh, demand. How much are people looking for offices in a particular city or a particular space uh, within a city? And we can start looking at this again. So if we look at two different regions, the one on the left, the one on the right, we can start measuring demand. Now we can do that in a number of different ways and the industry has done that for many years. But there are lots of other new data sources that we can start using. At the very simplest, we can, for example, look on uh, Google Trends to see what people are Googling for. So if they're looking for um, co-working space, in this case, uh, in London, or co-working space in Paris. And we can start seeing that this gives us an idea of where the people are searching from and what they're searching for. But again, as we introduce these new data sets, how do we know that this is not being influenced? If, for example, you wanted to influence one or two, why not just spend a lot of time searching there to put the demand or appear to put the demand up? Another way that we can look at buildings, again, number one or two here, is that we can look at planning applications that have been submitted. So on the top right, you've got a gym. Bottom right, you've got a, a, an open street cafe. In the middle, you've got a, a rubbish dump. On the left, you've got a medical and drug center. Top left, you've got a power station. Now, today we will often look at planning applications that have been both submitted and approved to understand where an area is going. But we work on the assumption that a planning application is only put in because people want to build that. As this starts feeding into the decision-making process, more and more about a building, and again, if you're looking for an office site, perhaps you'd be more likely to go for two than one in this case. There's more incentive for us to start submitting data to try and distort or influence those decisions. And against the backdrop of all of this, um, all of these different examples, the person is going to have to be making a judgment and taking responsibility for that data being um, objective uh, to, a, to a reasonable degree. And that's going to build in some real challenges as we move forward as a sector. So the next thing is I want to take it in a slightly different perspective and again ask whether we can trust uh, the data that we're seeing. Now to do this I've taken two research reports that were published last year, one by the University of North East England, the other by the River Institute. And without going into the ins and outs of what they mean, they're looking at the future investment. And uh, the top one there you can see says growth in Budapest and Warsaw. And the bottom one is really focusing on opportunity in the industrial sector. So based on this alone, you would say that uh, Budapest and Warsaw industrial uh, assets were, were a good place to look. The question is, how much of this can you trust? And the answer you probably won't be surprised to know is not a huge amount. So these quotes I made up completely off uh, the bat for the purpose of this presentation. So we can't trust those. And in fact, these reports are created by an online report making tool which makes professional looking reports in a matter of minutes. So those reports don't exist. In fact, the University of North East England, the Rivers Institute are also organisations that don't exist. So I put them into a random name generator and then I used a logo um, creator to create the logos for them. So we have professional looking reports, we have professional looking logos that um, actually don't exist at all. You probably by now won't be surprised to know that Professor Shan York and Dr. Rourke Canmore don't exist either. Again, this was a random name generated to create people. And perhaps most surprisingly of all, these people aren't who they say they are. In fact, these aren't even real people. So these are Im images created by artificial intelligence. These people do not exist. These are not photographs. And so what at first glance can appear to be relatively credible in insight that we wouldn't make decisions alone based on, but can certainly inform our thinking, we can actually start picking apart and realize that with technology, we can start creating things that look very credible, but actually aren't. We can start uh, spreading misinformation. And again, as a professional looking to invest or to value or to uh, manage a building, we're going to have to take responsibility for understanding these data sources and the validity of them, the ethics of them, and whether they're valid. So that's about what we collect and how we use the external data. I also want to then have a look at how do we use data. And to do this, I want to take an example of uh, Uber. So Uber had a software platform, had a software platform, allegedly called uh, Grable, <clears throat> which 
which they developed to take a load of data to try and help their business and help the driver's safety that are working for them. So they would, for example, identify where people worked and what they did. They used to use a load of different techniques that you can see on the screen to understand who people were, whether they were likely to pay and whether there was a risk. And I think that most people would say that that was a broadly ethical way of using data and software. You're protecting your business and you're protecting your drivers in this case. But what they got found out for doing was they were using exactly the same software and data techniques to avoid regulators. So for example, they would be recognizing when calls came from public sector or regulating buildings. They would look at credit card data um, that was uh, used by the public sector to avoid regulators. They'd look at the type of device that they were using or they were likely to use. Social media to inform whether they were, um, they were uh, regulators or not. And also regulators they identified using the app in a very different way. So they'd go in a lot and not actually call something and they'd use that. So you've got an example there, I think, of a really good, what I would consider ethical use of data and technology to protect a business, to protect the employees or the people working under your banner. But the very same data techniques and software is being used for what I think most people would say was a relatively unethical example. And again, it's not just about the data, whether it's ethical or not, and whether it can be trusted, but it's how we apply it. And this is very much the role of a person and a profession moving forward. So the last thing I want to look at is a, a term which I'm sure you're familiar with, which is statistics, statistics, and damn lies. And it's about how do we present data to make sure that it comes across in a fair, objective, and ethical way. So to give you an example, this is UK house price information taken from the UK government uh, for three regions that I've picked out as examples. So there you've got the Northeast, which you can see is broadly speaking stayed flat. The eastern region, which has gone up dramatically in recent years. And then on the right hand side, the London area, which has gone down quite a lot. All of this data is true, it's accurate data. <clears throat> but what I've done is through using different time frames and different scales, is exaggerated and um, put a picture there of the three different areas behaving differently. <clears throat> If we look at the actual data underlying it, the, the raw data, you can see that this is a little bit of a different story. So for sure, the Northeast has stayed relatively flat, but the East really hasn't grown a huge amount in that time. And London may have had a very small dip, but really nothing dramatic. And so there's a very much an ethical responsibility for professionals, not only in how we use data, how we apply it, but also how we then present it to make sure it's telling us the story or telling our clients the story that it should be. So it's a huge topic that we need to get to grips with and that very often there isn't going to be a right and a wrong answer um, that is one size fits all. But what I think that we can do to start with is to start looking at some guiding principles that we work towards as a sector. So I'm involved with an organization called the Real Estate Data Foundation, which is a not-for-profit and it's about building a community of people interested in data and spe specifically raising data ethics up the agenda. And that has, Six principles that we're asking companies to work towards. Um, I'd be delighted if anyone on here is able to go in and, and use these. And if you are able to sign up to show your support for them, that's great. And those principles very quickly are about being accountable. You must be accountable for the data that you collect and you use, whether that's in your business or in your building. Transparency is important. It's really important that you let people know what data you're collecting and why you're collecting it. It must be proportionate. <clears throat> There's a huge amount of data that you can collect that would theoretically improve the outcome. But if that's a huge investment and uh, invasion of privacy, then for sure we shouldn't be doing that. It must be a proportion of use. Data should always be designed from a confidential and private point of view. We've got to um, protect the privacy, and this is the area where in particular things like GDPR comes in. It's got to be lawful. We've obviously got to work within existing laws and regulations. And then finally, it should always be secure. Data is something that once released is very difficult to get back in the bottle. So it's got to be something that's designed in both buildings and businesses as an incredibly secure um, uh, space. So thank you very much indeed for listening. I hope that's been an interesting uh, gallop through some of the ethical implications. Ethics is really, really important. The data ethics, how we use technology is really important to the real estate sector, but it is going to become more so. We've got a great opportunity now to take the lead and get on the front foot before we start collecting data through everything. Data ethics applies to what we collect, how we collect it, and what we then do with it for clients.
And there are some steps that we can take to at least take a first step in the right direction. So thank you very much indeed for listening and uh, open to any questions that are out there. Thanks, thanks for the, uh, the presentation on, the, on data, really interesting. And we have questions actually. And sometimes uh, we have long questions. So I'm gonna try to be clear. <laughs> So a question from Soner from BED. Uh, commercial real estate investors were more focused on having smart systems, but during and after COVID, it seems like it is more important to understand human behavior patterns and creating the digital model of that pattern instead of digital twin. Do you think that the change is happening faster than before? And are the investors ready for the change? Long question. Yeah, <clears throat> so it's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> so, so I guess there, there were two, a couple of questions there. So one is, um, is, it, is it getting faster? I think and the answer is categorically yes. So the speeds of um, data collection is, is disproportionately growing, it's exponential, and, and that is only going to continue for many, many years. I think a lot of data ethics that has, work has been done in other industries is about uh, the data that we collect through Facebook, as an example, or websites or apps. And buildings are becoming more and more connected. So they're no longer just dumb blocks that we work in or we live in. They're becoming platforms for data collection. So for sure, the problem is going to get significantly better and bigger. I would say that property investors, uh, to generalize enormously, and of course, there is some very forward thinking and some less so, but I would say that generally they have taken quite a big step forward in the last few years to understand the value and the risk and the opportunity of data. And I think that property investors are now leading the way very often in how to behave and to look at this. I know a lot of property investors are very interested and supportive and exploring um, data ethics generally, as I think a lot of developers are. And I think this is going to be something that we, we can work on for a while before it really overwhelms us. But if we don't, I think it will overwhelm us in the coming years. I hope that answers the question. I hope so. <laughs> uh, the, the second part of the question was about the um, um, the uh, owners of, this, of the data. So, what about who owns the data? Yeah, no, that's also a very good question. That's probably a separate presentation. Um, so, so the the ownership of data. There are two separate things here, which get confused, I think. So, there's the ownership of the data, and there is the IP or the right to use it. And very often in a real estate sector, most of what we do, and not all by any stretch, but most of what we do tends to be based on uh, willfully ignoring that because we open and we recognize that data sharing helps us. So if you look at uh, the valuation process, if you look at lease comparisons, if you look at whatever it might be, it's built off if, by definition looking at what's available in the market. Now, as we go through, there are two separate questions that we need to ask. Firstly, who owns the data in evaluation or who owns the data in the, um, the building that we collect it? It doesn't have to be the right uh, one single answer that's always applied, but it's essential that there is an answer because I think that's going to be a real challenge moving forward. In a few countries around the world, we've started to see that big challenge and it's starting to cause uh, problems. The second thing is making sure that we have the right to use the data. So it doesn't matter whether we own it or not necessarily, it's about being allowed to use it. And I think that's something that we're a little bit further ahead, but still we have a, a long way to go. I think it's also worth saying that most professional bodies, most professional regulation and standards do say that you ought to be using data that you have the right to use in some shape or form, you ought to be responsible for it. And that poses a real problem because if, for example, professional indemnity insurance is looking at how we use data, if a professional body is saying you need to prove that you have the right to use it and we can't, that does start raising questions about how covered we are and how we operate as a business. And I think the second question I ask you is uh, pretty linked to that also uh, in terms of um, um, way to use the data. So how can we deal with G GPDR? And at the same time, the data info we need about people in the context of COVID. Mm. Well, I think that's an incredibly, well, it's an incredibly good question. And it's an incredibly important one. I'm not sure there is an easy answer. From my perspective, I think one of the most important things to do is about transparency. 
So the very worst case scenario is that you collect huge amounts of personal data on a person uh, or a company or a building and no one knows about it and there's no reason for doing it. One of the expressions that's very often said, which I don't really like, is that data is the new oil. And one of the reasons I don't like that is because it encourages people just to try and get as much of it as possible. Now, sometimes it is worth collecting data that we can't use now because it'll have value in the future, but we really need to be very clear about what we're collecting and why we're collecting it. And then we've got to be very clear about how we communicate that to other people. And whilst I wouldn't claim to be a GDPR expert, I think that that will go a long way to, um, to helping and, and improving some of those challenges. GDPR uh, and, and the legal side of things and ethics are absolutely overlapped. There is a, a significant mm -hmm. overlap between them. The point I wanted to make earlier is I don't think they are exactly the same thing. I hope that helps. So we switch to the next question from Roger. So to get um, good trusted uh, property data, should we rely on our established or presumably trusted property institution to gather and make that data available to subscribers? About the quality and the source of the data. Hi, Roger, thank you. Um, that, I mean, that's a great question. I think that, um, I think that there's an industry, so, so real estate is different from most sectors, uh, and we often claim to be more different than we are, but one of the ways that we are very different is that we are absolutely enormous as a sector, probably one of the largest from an employment and investment and financial point of view, but we're made up of an incredibly large number of very small companies. Even the biggest real estate companies have a very small market share if you compare it to the largest companies in the IT sector, the finance sector, the pharmaceutical sector. Now that in many ways is a good thing and that, that puts us in a really good position, but it is different and it means that we, we can never have just a small number of organizations that can collect enough data to be really valuable. And so, so whilst this is true in other sectors, I think in real estate it's more important than ever before and it's going to be more important than in other sectors to have trusted bodies who help collect, standardize and, um, and share that data. Now behind that, there are a number of questions. So for example, um, data, if it's competitive advantage, may not be something that you want to share. Uh, if you don't want to share it, then why should you be made to? How do you give it to people? How do you demonstrate the value of that? Data standards is something that I'm uh, doing a separate piece of work on at the moment. And a large part of the challenge there is how do we understand what's available and how do we understand the value of, of data standards? So standards being used is much, much easier and quicker uh, if they're free and open. But at the same time, if you want good standards, they do need to be maintained. We need to understand that value. So I think the answer is that certainly property sector institutions and organizations need to come together. Some of those are probably organizations that exist today. Some of those are probably organizations that, that need to be created or combined because data acts in a slightly different way from the traditional silos of the sector. But certainly, I believe it needs to be led by the institutions. Uh, what the actual outcome of those are, I think, is a little bit more complex. Roger, I hope that answers the question. I hope to I take this opportunity to ask my own question about skills of the organizations. What are the, um, the skills, specific skills within an organization um, we need to, to, to have. Is that different, you know, uh, in terms of uh, um, to, to, to deal with the data? Is that uh, different from uh, the way uh, organizations are, uh, are, or do they have to adapt, create a department, uh, recruit new talents? Um, yeah, that's no, a great question. I, I think, again, it, it depends on the type of business. But if we look at a valuer as an example, then the valuer today, or at least the valuer of, of the past, is responsible for collecting the data, analyzing it, presenting it, giving the advice and the judgment. They do the whole picture. And actually, more often than not, you'll find in larger companies, it's, it's split between a team. But there's still one person who takes responsibility for that. What we're seeing going forward is that each one of those stages is going to get more and more complicated, especially the data collection and the data analysis, and it's going to be done by more fragmented and specialist teams. 
So somewhere within that process, we're going to have to have people with very much different skills all the way through. I believe that that's uh, sort of data scientists and data collection organizations uh, all the way through to the, the visualization and then the human advisory bit. To provide the advice, so the valuer who actually is going to the client and advising them, I think it's essential that they have a base level understanding of what's happening and how they can take responsibility for that data. I don't believe they need to be a data scientist. The person who is giving that judgment needs to understand the market. Of course, they need to understand the basics of what's happening, but they're there to really understand the value of a property and work with clients to understand it. So I think that the entire sector is going to have to become more educated about data and technology at a basic level, but that does not mean that we all need to go and start coding or being data scientists in the next few days. Okay, interesting. Okay, so we are, we are good for today. Um, Thank you, Dan, for this great presentation and this uh, very big topic and strategic topic for the industry. Thank you all uh, for being with us today. Uh, I want to say that tomorrow is Friday and Friday is the Friendship Friday daily, uh, daily program. So the session will be in French uh, and we, uh, we will welcome Robin Rivaton. Um, so thank you again. Enjoy. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Be safe. And see you tomorrow for the one that uh, wants to connect tomorrow. Thanks, Sophie. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you. Bye.